If you've been following the microprocessor scene lately, you might be seeing a lot of talk about these things called threads. And while a thread isn't equivalent to a full, independent processing core, the general wisdom seems to agree that more threads equals better performance. And while that's true to an extent, there are also a lot of subtle nuances that come with multi-threaded CPU cores that can help improve the general usability of the chip, but can also introduce some overhead and general slowdown. Yeah, I know it seems kind of oxymoronic that multi-threading can both help and hurt the general performance of a microprocessor, but starting at a very base level, it's important to understand what exactly a CPU core is. Now, when you see that a CPU has, for example, four cores, what it actually means is that there are four full CPUs that can operate independently of one another and are integrated into the die. So, say you're an i3-8100, and you have access to four CPU cores. What that means is that you have to schedule tasks and access memory for four independent processors. And if you've ever been the lead of a small team of people, you know just how difficult it can be to keep everyone on the same page. That means, however, that one CPU core might have less of a load on it, so it finishes the tasks assigned to it sooner than another core. That means that you can throw some more tasks at the idle core, which takes clock cycles to access memory, pull the data, and decode and interpret it. Overall, it's obviously more efficient than loading everything onto one CPU, but there can still be slowdown, where the core waiting to be fed new instructions is sitting idle while the scheduler figures out what exactly it needs to do next. Now, you can help to reduce this latency by increasing the amount of on-die cache, keeping more of the data closer to where it will be processed. And looking at what AMD did with the game cache in their Zen 2 microarchitecture, they essentially did that to improve overall memory bandwidth and access times, which means that the cores are sitting idle for less time. And based on the success of 3rd Gen Ryzen, I'd say that it was a pretty smart move on AMD's part, especially since integrating more cache into the CPU die is now cheaper and doesn't hog as much die space that could be used by logical processes, thanks to TSMC 7 nanometer process. Obviously, there are other details that I'm skimming over, but another solution to this is to feed more instructions per clock into the core, meaning that the scheduler is essentially buying itself time to figure out future processes. Intel has generally been king when it comes to this, and that explains why they've had performance dominance in gaming for so many years, but now that AMD is catching on and improving the overall efficiency of their cores, Intel has to rely on another trick to improve processing times. And this was introduced with their hyper-threading technology, which in its generic form is known as simultaneous multi-threading. And it's used by both the red and the blue team to help give their physical cores more of a performance edge. But let's focus on how each company implements this into their chips. Starting off with Intel, their hyper-threading technology was actually first introduced back in 2002, but the roots of the technology actually date back to the 1950s. And the basic idea behind it is to break a physical processor into two logical processors that your operating system can address as independent threads. And on these threads, they can assign completely unrelated tasks to whatever process is idle, even if the threads are part of the same physical core. That means that in one CPU core, it's essentially executing two independent instructions for every cycle. This can help improve hardware multitasking, but when you split a core up into two threads, you're also halving the amount of resources available to each logical core. And that's ultimately why multi-threading isn't the same as doubling the physical core count. Now, because hyper-threading is a patented Intel technology, there's some secret sauce going on under the hood that they won't share with the general public. But on average, each Intel thread is more efficient with its resource allocation, meaning that each thread can perform more tasks more efficiently. On the other hand, AMD's multi-threading works in a very similar way. But like I said before, there are some hardware features that are patented by Intel that technically makes their hyper-threading technology different from AMD's implementation. But at a fundamental level, the hardware is tricking the software into thinking that there are twice as many lanes that it can execute instructions on. But with this also comes the drawbacks. And one of the first things that come to mind is just the overall complexity of designing a CPU core with this in mind. Multi-threading requires more circuitry to be packed into each core, which increases the overall area physically taken up on the die, meaning that chips with multi-threading are technically more expensive to produce than a chip lacking this feature. And generally speaking, it's not like implementing SMT suddenly doubles the size of your die. 
In fact, Intel says that SMT only increases core size by about 5%, but can improve performance by as much as 30%. So if you're looking to squeeze a significant amount of performance from a chip, then implementing SMT is a cheaper way of increasing data throughput without increasing the amount of physical cores on the die. And now you can see why both AMD and Intel, but more so AMD, rely on multi-threading to bump the performance of their individual cores without drastically increasing their production costs. And while doing this can help keep costs down, meaning that less of the price is passed on to the consumer, introducing SMT can also create issues on the software side of things, where having less of this single-threaded throughput can negatively impact the performance profile of programs not written to keep this architectural design in mind. A great example of this is a benchmark we ran in our last video, and that's Crisis. When this game released, the general trend for hardware was keeping core counts low, but increasing clock speeds over time. This means that games written before probably around 2013 aren't built with these modern levels of parallelization in mind. And when we limit the Ryzen 5 1600 to only utilizing 6 multi-threaded lanes, its performance can't match a native 6-core CPU with SMT disabled. I guess what I'm trying to say is that while increasing thread counts can boost overall performance for programs where multi-core utilization is already baked in, if you're a software developer, writing programs designed to parallelize workloads is significantly more complex than writing them to just map onto a couple of cores. It not only requires more work on the part of the engineers designing the circuitry and the processor, but it also requires more work on the part of the engineers writing the software. But ever since the release of the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, games have been much less reluctant to take advantage of additional threads, due to both the consoles running CPUs with high core counts, but at incredibly low clock speeds. I'm sure you've heard the term of going wide with software design, and this approach means that you break up tasks into smaller chunks that can be more easily parallelized. Looking at the design of graphics cards, this technique has been around for over two decades, but when comparing rasterization operations to full x86-64 instructions, the GPU has to compute far less complex terms, because most of the work in setting up the scene is already done by our CPU, and all your graphics card really has to do is to draw geometry in the locations where it's told to. Now, even though there are some drawbacks with SMT, especially on the design side of things, when implemented correctly, it can boost overall IPC and performance in a very noticeable way. Looking at AMD's Zen microarchitectures, many of the chips, even the relatively inexpensive ones, support multi-threading, and while it doesn't necessarily make or break the chips it's used in, it's utilized in a way that helps give each physical CPU core more of a performance edge. If you want to think in terms of analogies, multi-threading is sort of like giving an assistant to a core. Sure, the assistant isn't as capable or knowledgeable about the tasks as the person they're working for, but having some extra help allows them to focus more on the necessary processes, because it can offload some of the less vital work onto someone else. It's obviously not a perfect comparison, but the basic idea stays the same when applied to processing cores. It's not the same as straight up doubling the amount of physical cores, but it helps to spread the workload out more evenly, rather than trying to run more data through a single pipeline. It ultimately leads to less congestion in the ALU, which helps to free up clock cycles that can be utilized in future computations. It's an incredibly complex topic, but if you're interested, there are plenty of great resources that can explain SMT in much more depth than I can in this video. And documents from AMD, Intel, and even NVIDIA are great resources if you're interested in learning how this specific concept is implemented. And while I'd rather have twice the amount of cores in a chip, it still makes more economical sense to settle for SMT, because it's not only cheaper on the company and the consumer, but the bump in performance is also so drastic that it's honestly worth including in most, if not all, processing chips. So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I'm sorry this video was so technical and full of alphabet soup, but the idea driving SMT is pretty abstract and pretty hard to get a basic understanding of without having a lot of hardware engineering qualifications. For me, it took me about two weeks of relatively intense research for this to click in my head, and even so, I still don't fully understand every single design nuance. It's super complex, but if you're interested, it's a great way to pass the time if you're a nerd like me, 
and you can honestly learn a lot about computer science, computer engineering, and electrical engineering if you spend the time to not only understand the high-level ideas, but also the fundamental concepts used to implement such a complex pipeline. It was fun talking, and if you want to learn more about computer hardware or software, then the annotations on screen are a great place to start. Thanks for spending your time with me, and thanks for watching.